Okay, folks, how are we doing? Okay. All right, good. Our presenter is still in makeup, so we're going to do a full rehearsal without him. We'll just fill in the pieces in the studio. Let's do a full rehearsal from the top. Rax, everything queued up? Anyway. All right, cool. Sound all right? Yes, boss. Thanks a lot. Let's go. We've pre-cut the intro and the archive from yesterday. Yep. Okay, let's on see. BTA. We're going to go from titles on a... Roll it. VTRA Q-Tape. The government has launched an inquiry after the Liberian registered sea empress was severely holed on rocks off St Anne's Head at the mouth of the Milford Haven waterway. A five mile oil slick began washing ashore this morning, prompting the biggest clean up operation ever mounted in Wales. Okay, back to studio on three. Wide shot in studio, slow track in. We'll explain that that was 36 hours ago. The sea empress is still there. And at this point, we're going to go to the new piece that's just come in, which you we queued it up. Yep, somebody. Okay. Let's take that piece. PTRB Q-tape. First light revealed the full extent of the disaster. Twelve tanks were ruptured and four million litres of oil spread out across one of the most ecologically sensitive areas of Britain. Salvage experts were lowered onto the ship by helicopter this morning. Their priority to restore power. It's being called the Sea of Death. In every direction, millions of litres of crude oil destroying everything in its path. It's now routine for the oil to leak as the tide falls, but the scale of the spill took observers and environmentalists by surprise. It's just causing so much damage, isn't it, to the environment? It's Are people tragic. angry? Oh, extremely. There's a growing sense of anger and frustration that this ecological time bomb remains a threat. Questions are now being asked as to why she ran aground, but the man with the ultimate responsibility blamed the weather, not lack of resources for the delays. OK, nice piece. Tell the boy he did well. We're back to the studio on four. Close up with the presenter. He's going to intro the first science piece, Oil and Water, queued up. Yep. Let's see it. Thank you. Zero. This is the cause of the problem, crude oil. Inside this flask is Venezuelan crude oil, which has a very thick consistency. Pour it into a flask of water, and this is what happens. So it's true what we learned at primary school, oil and water don't mix. Now of course the seas aren't usually so calm. Heavy seas can disperse oil, like this. As you can see, the oil is breaking up into droplets and dispersing in the water. And this is exactly what happened in the Shetlands when the Brea ran aground. The Brea was another large tanker. It ran into the rocks off the Shetland Islands in the north of Scotland. Here the seas were heavy enough and the waves big enough to disperse the oil. And nature had helped clean up for us. Unfortunately, this isn't likely to happen in the enclosed waters around Milford Haven. OK, we're going to go for the emotional eco-destruction sequence. Let's have it, please. BTD Q-Tape. The destruction of the Welsh coastline continues. This morning, the people of Milford Haven woke to find oil lapping at their doorsteps. A change in the wind is increasing the scale of the disaster. Along South Pembrokeshire's holiday beaches, the air was thick with fumes. Manor beer was just one of many stained with the legacy of the Sea Empress. By mid-morning, the oil began washing up on shore. Locals looked on in horror as the five-kilometre oil slick blighted pristine beaches. But it's the wildlife for which this area is internationally renowned that could yet pay the highest price. One of the rangers has just picked up this bird. As you can see, it is completely covered in this oily, thick black bitumen. It's absolutely tragic to see a bird in this condition, and clearly it just didn't stand a chance. More than 1,400 rare birds are known to be oiled. This disgusting filth is in every nook and every cranny of the coastline. 
This is what our seabirds are competing with. This is what our seals are having to swim through. And there is no way we can get to every inaccessible point, even by boat, to clean it up. Tonight, the Port Health Authority advised people not to eat fish or shellfish caught in the oily waters of Britain's only coastal national park. Stand by VTR E next. Thank you. Okay, that'll have them crying at home. Now, back to studio, on two I think this time. Medium close up, we ask the viewers question. If oil and water don't mix, why on earth can't we separate them and get this muck off more easily? Okay, got the piece, the collection v piece? Yep, VTE Q tape. At the record low tide, shortly after one o'clock, oil was belching out. At the scene, the oil cleanup vessels were dwarfed, not just by the tanker, but by the slick itself. The only thing in the salver's favour is the unusual northerly wind, but that is set to change to the prevailing southwesterly, blowing the oil onto the coast. This is a prototype of a system of scooping oil from the surface of the sea. Take a wheel and cause it to rotate in the water. Make the wheel out of an oleophilic material, a material that attracts droplets of oil to it and causes them to stick to its surface. Scrape the oil off the wheel and divert it into a collecting tank and the job's done. But it's not so easy out at sea where there are small items called wind and waves. Here the first problem is to catch your oil. This morning there was renewed activity around the Sea Empress. Booms were towed out to surround the stricken giant. Booms are designed to prevent the spread of oil from the ship and they trap it so that skimmers can be used. There's activity everywhere, but is it too little too late? Four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, everything too late around here is our presenter. Is he still in makeup? Fantastic. What does he do? All right, well, we come back to you on two, Ian, in studio, mid shot. He's going to explain that the weather has got worse, too much oil has Stand escaped, and in heavy scenes, booms are useless. Okay, we're going to ask the other question, which I want to know the answer to as well. Why can't we burn it? Is that tape ready? Let's roll it, please. VTF Q tape. Two, one, zero. There's one other thing we learned about oil at primary school, that it burns, doesn't it? Steve, can you try and ignite this oil? There is oil and water in this tank. The oil was poured onto the water 24 hours ago and left. And it doesn't want to burn. Any idea why? Let's try again, this time with fresh oil from airtight containers. This oil has never been exposed to the air. Thank you. Steve, will you ignite the oil, please? Aha, uh -huh, success! That's because it's the vapours that burn and not the oil itself. The flames appear to be dancing on the surface of the oil. What's happening is that compounds with low boiling points are evaporating and the vapours mix with oxygen in the air. This mixture burns. When the compounds with the lowest boiling points are burnt off, the fire will go out because there's not enough heat to burn off the rest of the oil. So what can we do? Try this, heat it. As the temperature rises, compounds with higher boiling points begin to evaporate. You can see the bubbles on the surface. Once again, the vapours mix with air, and once again, the mixture burns. That's why when oil's been floating on the sea for a long time, there's little chance of setting fire to it. Oh, and there's another problem, smoke. Would you like this happening on your doorstep? Burn crude oil and you get thick black smoke. Most of it carbon, which hasn't oxidized to carbon dioxide. And the higher the boiling point of the compounds, the thicker the smoke. 
At this point, we're going to do the graphic sequence, but rather than go back to studio, I want to mix from one to the other. Let's bring in, can you give me a one second mix? Yeah. Okay, graphic sequence coming in on two. Let's take that piece. VTE Q tape. Let's see it. Crude oil is a mixture of chemical compounds. Put it under increasing magnification, and this is what you might see. At first, nothing but a dark brown soup. Then, out of the soup, strange shapes begin to appear. At a magnification of 100 million, the molecules that make up crude oil become apparent. Millions of them, all made up of hydrogen and carbon, the smaller molecules moving faster than the large. Most are arranged in chains like this, a molecule of decane C10H22. Ten carbon atoms, shown here in black, and 22 white hydrogen atoms bonded to them. And this is methane, the smallest of the hydrocarbons. Four hydrogen atoms bonded to a single carbon atom. And here is octane, the isomers of which are found in petrol. So, crude oil is a mixture of hydrocarbons, a mixture of short and long chain molecules, each of which behave differently. The longer the chain length, the higher the boiling point, the more viscous the material. These differences are the basis of the modern oil refining industry. Nice piece of graphics, brownie points all round, look like a Pet Shop Boys video to me, but did explain it. Okay, oil refinery insert next, Q. QB, two, one, and zero. take it. This is where the Sea Empress should be, at this terminal in Milford Haven, discharging her 120,000 tonnes of crude oil. From here, the crude is pumped along pipelines to the refinery. Its first stop will be in a distillation plant like this. The column they're called fractionating columns, separate the crude into its various groups of useful compounds. It's a complex, highly controlled business. First, the oil is heated. In this pipe, its temperature is about 580 degrees Celsius. It is pumped into the fractionating column, within which there is a temperature gradient about 500 degrees Celsius at the bottom, 200 degrees Celsius at the top. The compounds with boiling points over 500 degrees Celsius condense at the bottom of the column. These are long chain molecules. The rest begin to rise, separating themselves out according to boiling point, condensing as the temperature falls. Short chain molecules like methane have the lowest boiling points. They rise towards the top of the fractionating column. You can see them bursting through the one-way valve or bubble cap in each of the stages. Eventually the separation will be complete and different groups of compounds can be drawn off at different levels. Short chain molecules, here shown in the blue, are drawn off as gases. Longer chain molecules, shown as green and yellow, condense as liquids in the middle of the column. The very long chain molecules, orange and red, settle in the bottom of the column. These form solids when cool. OK, back to studio on one. Quick explanation, latest update, where we're up to now. Q. QC210. And 1 minute 37 on clip.
the oil continues to come ashore. As it spreads, more and more of it is exposed to the air and the more volatile compounds evaporate. It's the heavy fractions which are reaching the shore. On the sea, it flattens the waves. On the beaches, it approaches the consistency of tar. The environmental considerations uh, of the areas near the spill should affect the techniques that are used greatly because many of these sensitive areas may be sensitive to damage by the cleanup techniques that are used. The message is clear. Cleaning by hand is safe. Heavy machines are fine on the beaches, but they damage sensitive areas like rock pools and salt marshes. And this, the spraying of dispersants, probably adds one toxic mixture, the dispersant, to another, the oil. The cure could be worse than the disease. Nice piece that may change on air, don't worry about that. It will, whatever the case, bring us to the final think piece on dispersants. Will dispersants work? Let's cue the demo. QD, two, one. This is now one of the world's biggest ever oil spills. Only the Brea disaster in the Shetlands was more severe. Throughout the day, a hundred tons of toxic dispersants have been sprayed in an effort to break up the oil. This is oil floating on water, and this is the magic ingredient. Now, if I wait a few moments... Hey, presto! The oil's disappeared. Well, it hasn't totally disappeared. It gets broken up into droplets, which are dispersed throughout the water. And the magic ingredient? Detergent. Just like washing up liquid we use in the kitchen. Want a closer look? This flask contains oil, water and a dispersant. Pour out some of the mixture and you can see the droplets of oil scattered throughout it. Zero. OK, back to studio. I think of MCU on four. We're going to ask why haven't they used dispersants before? Why have they waited 36 hours? Cue it. Cue Whether to use dispersants or not is often a critical um, uh, debate doing an incident. There's often a, a, a balancing act to be uh, uh, done as to whether or not the uh, uh, damage that dispersants might cause to certain forms of marine life uh, is adequately balanced by the improvements to the um, um, physical um, uh, situation on the beach, especially during the um, tourist season, which is so important to the economy of this part of Wales. With 50,000 tonnes of oil already in the water and more pouring out with every passing moment, Dispersants are being used, regardless of the environmental cost. And out to a big wide shot in studio. We're nearly there, folks. Well done, everybody. Just stay with it. This is the up sum, four main points to make. So we do a slow track on four, in onto the main desk. We explain that it's too late to trap it. You can't burn it. Please take this down, graphics. We can use graphics as well. The seas aren't rough enough to disperse it. Finally, chemical dispersants can be more toxic than oil, which is what I thought in the first place. OK, then we leave the show. Big question, when can we go to the beaches again? Probably next century. OK, Q. QF. Well done, everybody. Nice work. See our presenter later. Ten-minute tea break. OK, ten minutes? Great. OK, then we'll do it.